How is your past playing into your present? How are you, how are the, 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 the symptoms in your body, the anxiety, the distress, the body pains, the physical pains, how are those actually expressions of what you're holding inside? Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today we have my dear friend, Dr. Omid Naeem, an integrative psychiatrist based here in Los Angeles. And he's here to talk about why is society so sick? We're gonna diagnose society and talk about a lot of layers that are contributing to the epidemic of mental health disorders, both in the micro and the macro. Stay tuned, it's a fascinating conversation. Omid, thank you for joining us back on the Broken Brain Podcast. It's uh, an honor to have you back here with us. Thank you very much, great to be back with you. So a big reason why I wanted to have you in for this conversation is that we have jammed out on the phone, in person, at dinners, and we talk about the micro and the macro. So if people imagine an integrative psychiatrist working with a patient, an individual person, there are themes in that person's life that led to them experiencing whatever kind of suffering they might be going through or chronic disease or diagnosis. Yeah. But interestingly enough, a lot of the same themes that apply to the individual can be applied to society. Yeah. What we see in the individual we can see in society. And I think in this day and age, you know, recording this right after an election has happened in the midst of what some people would say is the most divided country that we've ever had, although there's a little bit of debates around that, but you know, a lot of people would, at least it feels that way to a lot of people. What are some of the themes that you see? If you look at, if, an, if we ask an integrative psychiatrist to look at the current state of society in America, what are the, some of the themes that you see in your patients that you're also seeing in society as a whole? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a, a quick statement on like how I got started was this exact thing. I was working with a family with my w current now wife. At the time, we shared a client, this family, that you saw so much of what they were struggling with was the effects of life in, in, in modern times. And father was an ex-Vietnam veteran. And we were, we were asked to analyze them as a family and medicate them. And there's something wrong with you. Whereas really, it, they're, a, they're an expression of what's happening in society. Like it really made sense. If you look at their story, their symptoms made sense. Um, which is something we say a lot in our clinic is that that your symptoms actually make sense. These are the like the fever. So, um, but the real infection is something that's happening in how we're living. So, what are the? I think the, I think that some of the biggest things we see are the way we live in in Western society. There is a really big problem with loneliness. You know, 60, 60 plus percent of people in studies report that they don't have a single person to go to um, in a time of, of crisis and a struggle. You know, when you look at homelessness, you can, which is rising, you can say, well, there's so many factors to it. But part, one of the factors is that at the end of the day, if someone reaches that point of breakdown, they have they don't have a single person that they can still go to and say, hey, there's no way I'm going to let you be on the streets. That family structure. Or friendship and, you know, people that like a bond that says, hey, I'm going to be there for you because I know you're going to be there for me. You know, we can go into that. Like, what does it really mean to be in community? Um, that we, we don't have that real community. We have really complex social lives. We have intense social networks. But socializing is... is, is um, is is entertainment socializing is 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 strategy towards moving in society it's not community it's not the same thing as a real deep bond so our 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 mental health is very much a consequence of that if you if you buy a house plant you get a card that tells you what's the right amount of water what's the right amount of um you know, sun, right? How to care for this plant, right? That's an ecological approach that scientists study the plant. What's the right niche, right? That this plant evolved to thrive in. I said earlier, we're making, you know, we're working in the nonprofit to support schools seeing themselves as an ecosystem, actually. 
And how do you optimize health? Well, we know that based on our evolution. We know what we evolved to thrive for. And we we evolve like water and sun for us is very much, you know, relationships and not just not social relationships, but deep bonds of commitment to each other. Um, and that's what's narrowing and narrow, narrowing more and more progressively, um, very much because we actually don't need each other anymore. It's it's so true, and and this has all sorts of implications. You know, there was, uh, um, especially there's. I've just noticed a personal thing in my own life when I go on Facebook, which is very rarely. It's mostly to just to post something or share an interview that I'm doing. Yeah, I I noticed that the most radical. This is my own projection on the situation. I noticed that sometimes the most radical opinions and what I would deem to be extreme sides of you know conspiracies of whatever is going on in society yeah are coming from people who really are not in a tight knit family structure yeah that's not a criticism on it it could be somebody who's older in fact there was a study we'll link to it in the show notes that older people you know we're always worried about kids and how much time they're spending on technology i'm kind of worried about people you know above the age of 60 and how much time they're spending on facebook and whatsapp and all these things yeah. and there's been a couple studies done that shows that older people living alone are more likely to share fake news than people who are younger and have like friend groups yeah really yeah yeah, yeah fascinating yeah i know there's a, um i don't remember the author but there's a there's in in the i think in the 70s when terrorism was first starting to be um used as a method for 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 political gain um there was a book written called the true believer and it was like a psychological expose of like what is what is the psychological type of this person who is willing to kill themselves for a political cause, blow themselves up to do something so extreme? And it's very much somebody who is on the outskirts of society, that they're, they're often a young male. Um, but mainly the thing was that they, 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 they don't have anywhere that they feel meaningfully plugged in to the community, that they have a role, that they have anything meaningful to offer and that they're needed or they belong anywhere. You know, that 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 what it is to be in community is to have a purpose, to have a meaning in life, that I mean something, I have some impact. I think you could kind of wonder if the shootings that were going on in the last few years were like, you could say like maybe the most extreme versions of where society seems like it's going as a whole, that we're we are more and more alienated and becoming more and more outraged. You know, we're, you, you, the, the outrage is like a, it's a vitriol of meaning, right? We're, 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 we're screaming for there's, there, there's meaningful things going on in life. We're, we're, we're arguing for something vehemently. What is it we're missing on the ground in our real lives that then becomes amplified, right, online and that in forms of just attention, which means you don't really get nurtured. It's like calorieless food, right? You just keep eating it more and more because you're not really getting the nurturing at the level that the desire is coming from. I'm sure you have patients who come in and in part of the conversation, it becomes revealed that this person is really lonely. They're suffering with loneliness or maybe they don't have these tight community bonds in, in their world. When you yeah. talk to them, and I know it's individual, but it sounds so basic, but it's like, what are the steps that people take and how can we extrapolate that to society as a whole? Like when you are helping yeah. someone step back into community, it seems so simple and yet it seems so daunting because community is really an interdependent thing. It's not just our own actions and efforts that create it. Yeah. So what do you tell them and how can we think about that for society as a whole? Yeah. What really drove me in early, early in my career as a, as, as a consumer myself of mental health you know, services, you could say, um, was a, a frustration that you 
if you if you seek out therapy, um, or even if you seek out a psychiatrist, you go and you see them, and with a psychiatrist, they may give you a diagnosis. You have depression, you have anxiety, but what does that really tell you other than like you have you have an illness where you knew you had an illness and now you know the name for it. Maybe it tells you a little bit more than that. Um, especially though, if you see a psychotherapist, you, you get what I mean is you, you, you may go weeks or months trying to figure out, well, what's the real reason here? What's the story? What's the story behind why I'm here needing help? And you're supposed to figure it out as you go and you're supposed to figure it out yourself with, you know, you're like, you know, you feel great if the therapist tells you something, you know, that's meaningful and it makes sense, right? Um, I think that the, the, the approach we take is well-intended and has a lot of great benefits, but we should be able to, at the outset, give people a more full picture of here's what's going on, you know? We shouldn't depend on their story. And that, that can sound, you know, awful, like, well, you, you should listen to somebody's story, but our stories are so governed by the culture we're steeped in. So let me give you an example. Um, on any given day, I have a client come in and they, 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 they've been on medication for 20 years. They, they sought me out because they want a different approach. When did you start medication? I was seven years old. Okay. What was going on then? Nothing. Okay. Why do you think you have, you needed it? Well, I saw therapist and they told me I have a I have OCD. That's why I need medication is because I have OCD. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I have a disorder that's causing me to need medication and be sick. Later in the conversation, I asked them about what was your childhood like? What was your family like? Well, my parents got divorced. How old were you when they got divorced? I was, I was eight years old. Okay. Well, if you were eight years old, they got divorced. They probably were having difficulties at least one year before, right? You don't just suddenly get divorced from a happy marriage. Was it stressful? Well, I don't remember. You don't remember. Well, what do you remember? Well, I actually have difficulty remembering most things in my life before 12, 13, 14, which I know is actually rare. We, we, we should have continuous memory at that age. That person should remember what their family life was like and their childhood was like. So then I'll come around and I'll say, well, you know, this is again from that ecological lens, meaning I know what a healthy individual evolved to thrive in. And I also know from the research that there's a high link, divorce, childhood stress because of family discord, these things affect us. Um, so we can paint a picture and we can also put that against what the way in which the culture of psychiatry and psychotherapy has also influenced our beliefs. So for instance, I'll come around and I'll say, well, do you think that the family stress might have been why you were starting to have anxiety? No, I never thought that. Why not? Well, I was told most people get divorced. Most of the people in my community, most of my friends' parents were divorced. Now, I'm not here to say that, I'm not here to question the morality or, or, or that of like getting a divorce. I think that, that that's a different conversation, but a real frank analysis of like, what are the needs of a child growing up? We evolved to need multiple caregivers. For 99.99% .99 of our evolution as primates and mammals, we grow up with uncles, aunts, cousins, many, many eyes who know us and track us, right? The 50s, was the birth of the nuclear family as an idea. That's a new experiment in, 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 in the, the, you know, if you're gonna start a business, you figure out what do you need to make that business succeed, right? The, if you're gonna start it in a society, like is the nuclear family gonna be sufficient? We're only a you know, number of decades into figuring that out. And then in the 80s, divorce became a lot more prevalent. Well, if you look at the changes in disability and mental illness, they, they rise in peaks around these huge shifts in culture. In the 50s, you see a huge increase in mental illness. In the 80s and 90s, you saw a huge increase in mental illness, right? Um, so when someone comes into my office, tying back to what I originally said, like what I really wanted to do differently is I think we should be able to give somebody a pretty decent overall picture at the beginning of the work, I should be able to buy an hour, hour and a half, reflect back to you, 
how does your past playing into your present? How are you, how are the, 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 the symptoms in your body, the anxiety, the distress, the body pains, the physical pains, how are those actually expressions of what you're holding inside? How is your lifestyle? Um, where, where, are the, where are the places in your lifestyle that, that you maybe feel chaotic or workaholic? What are the substances or the sugar or the foods that you struggle with? And how are those actually expressions of your difficulty carrying something that needs resolution from your childhood are you feeling like your work is meaningful we need meaningful work it, we have to feel creatively inspired we have to feel like our work has purpose we have to feel like we have some creative freedom like the research shows that we need those things to feel good so those are valid questions if you piece all of that together you can see a whole person approach through a whole person approach and and how they all intersect you can in an hour and a half say to somebody, here's what I think is your story. Everybody's story is unique, but our basic biology is the same. We need to feel healthy and regulated in our body. We need to feel connected, purposeful and meaningful in relationships. And we need to have creative pursuits that inspire us, that give us joy, right? And if you piece all that together, I think you can, you can, you can actually recover, which is something that we don't, talk about anymore it really is i love that analogy that you talk about with business because so many other aspects of life we would say what do we actually need to make this successful yeah and we don't often do that when it comes to human beings because going back to another point you made earlier it can seem through modern life that we just don't really need each other as much yeah we don't need each other to, you know, we went and got coffee for you, you know, right before the interview. Yeah. Well, somebody grounded those beans. We didn't know them. Somebody made those beans into coffee, yeah. prepared it, put it in a cup. Somebody made that cup. Yes, we need people, but we're not reliant on that. Like we don't know the people that we need for basic survival even in this yeah. day and age. Yeah. Whereas in our evolutionary um, past, no human being could fetch fetch wood you know to, sorry fetch water chop wood hunt on their own you needed to know people yeah. and i've uh you know i've used kind of a little bit of this methodology that you and you and i have talked about and i would say that previously we needed each other for survival but now actually if we want to thrive and really rise to the occasion of modern life we need other people for to thrive. And if we don't have other people in the right relationships in our life, we start to go backwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so many people think community just means nurturance. It means good feeling towards each other. It means loving each other. Love meaning um, positive, giving, right? Like if you, you're, we're talking about the micro and the macro, well, we're decades into public health addressing mental health issues that keeps thinking that we need to give more, more services, more services. Now we, we actually, you know, I came through the public health system and we don't have a shortage of services, you know, being in community, like the, when you say like the, the coffee, right. And fetching water. If I, until this very recent time that technology means I have no reason to know who just brought, you know, who made the coffee. If I wanted coffee and I couldn't get it myself, that person who helps me will only help me based on how I'm conducting myself. How do I conduct myself? Do I take good care of myself? Do I treat my relationships with good conduct? Do I adhere to values that that person shares, right? So community is about very much like how we conduct ourselves, right? In modern life, I can come here today and espouse great ideas and appear so well, and, and yet I can go into my silo, right? And I can be an awful husband. I could be an awful father. I could be abusing drugs, you know? We don't, we, we can hide in modern life, right? The technology that we, the technologies that we've had have afforded us so many positive things, but they keep separating 
conscious experience so that we we don't really have to have integrity. Um, and so in community is about integrity. Community is about how I live and how I conduct myself. And that's what I think optimal health is about, right? Like when you look at people who transform their lives, it's because they bring integrity to their lives. It's because they, they care for themselves, their relationships based on the values that are intrinsic to them and they live by those values. And that's what integrity is, is that my actions are in line with my values. Um, yeah. I think that plays out in so many interesting ways in today's, in today's culture. And I think one of those ways is when you deem, you know, we just went through an election. I have friends that voted differently than I did. And some of my conversations with these friends, at least, you know, the close ones, like my favorite type of person I always tell people is somebody who has a different opinion than I do, but is willing to take me on the journey of how they got there yeah. and have a honest debate back and forth yeah. about what we believe in. And we can still be friends. In fact, we can be close friends and have different opinions. Yeah. We had a gentleman, another buddy of mine, Peter Crone, who was on the podcast. And he said, you know, if you went through, so, so many times we want to write off somebody else's opinion of the world as wrong or, or misguided. But the truth is, if you went through every single thing that they went through, maybe had the same parents, brought up in the same society, had the same experiences growing up, went to the same church, you know, had the, whatever it might be, you probably, even if you think of your opinions as so high and mighty, you probably end up looking at the world very similarly to how they do. Yeah. And why I'm bringing up this point is that when it comes to looking at people who have different opinions than we do, evolutionarily, we had to play nice. Now, play nice doesn't mean you can't express your own opinions, you can't put in your own thoughts onto a subject. It just means there has to be a certain level of openness and dialogue because you're going to be stuck with this person. They're yeah. in your village. You know, they know your dad, they know your neighbor, whoever it might be. And you can have an honest conversation without writing them off. The other aspect is yeah. when you actually really get to know somebody, you see their humanity. No matter how much you actually disagree with them on public policy, on, on foreign relations, whatever it might be, you know at the end of the day, this person's a good husband, they come home. Or on yeah. the flip side, you know that even if they agree with you, they're a shitty husband or, or person or, or they're causing a lot of ruckus, even though they have the same opinions as you. Yeah. Yeah, either way, you're not reduced to a black and white. You're not reduced to a black and white. All good, all bad, right? You're not reduced to this is good, this is bad, that's right, this is wrong. I'm on the right side, they're on the wrong side. Meanwhile, I can also think I'm wrong about everything privately in my head, right? You know, how many people spend their day all criticizing themselves? Um, and then I think they're often the ones that, that are the most outraged. It's this black and white thinking um, that we're really stuck in. You know, I'm sure you even see that. I, th I think it's good to go between, again, the micro and the macro. I'm sure you see a core pattern. You know, I shared this quote on Instagram a few months ago, and it says, the more critical you are of others, the tendency is the more critical you are of yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You're, you can't train your brain to only focus on other people and do its best job to criticize them, how they might dress, their opinions, what, what they might do, yeah. how they're living their life. Your brain can't just turn on for other people. And then when it comes to you, it's a loving, compassionate, right. caring thing that says, oh, you tried your best. Oh, you tried that project, it didn't work out. That's okay, give it your best shot. You were doing your best. No, your hypercritical brain that wants to tear everybody else apart is tearing you apart on a daily basis, which drives so much suffering. That's right. What you're, what you're saying is giving me a chance to give really due credit to one of the biggest influences on me. Please. In a lot of what I've already said, but this gives me a chance to really give him credit. Like, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a journalist, Sebastian Unger, who wrote a book, Tribe. I think we've talked about that book. Yeah. Um, and um, what he talks about, one thing he cites is that if you look at research on mental health services after big events like an earthquake, fire, after 9-11 in New York City, we think that actually mental health problems go up, right? 
but they actually don't. That really consistency, consistently you can see that mental health services actually really go down. I think it was down 50% after 9-11, the first year after 9-11. Why is that? And and just for context, that's in the like in the United States as a in whole. In the United States, okay, yeah. So not just yeah. in the New York area, in the United States. Yeah, well. he goes through a lot of different events throughout history, and he shows that there's there's evidence that we actually, when we have to come together, our mental health problems go down. Now, why why is that? So the the name of his book that he write, that he writes us about is called Tribe, and he said our 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 biology is still the same biology of the primate and the human throughout civilization that lived in tightly knit bands of people, maybe 20, 25 people max, where you intimately know each other. Now, what that means is that everything we've been talking about, you can kind of summarize is like when you're living in community, when you're actually in an actual relationship, which means you are interdependent, then you have to tolerate each other. Right, you can't shout each other down. If if you're out in the wild, and you're bickering, you're the one who's going to get eaten by the lion. Right, like it's it's the band that sticks together, and just sticking together means we have to tolerate each other. So there's all these virtues and skills like courage, bravery, as well as like virtues of restraint, like temperance, patience, humility. Right, virtues of the heart, compassion, loving kindness, curiosity. All those things are requirements to be part of a group. So when you when you have to enact those innate capacities we have in us, because they are innate, they're not constructs, right? They're actually part of our biological, they, they emerge from our, bi- our biology, is that we have to be patient with each other. We have to have compassion for each other. Otherwise, we can't work in groups together. Those virtues, those qualities, are precisely the ones that are protective for depression, for anxiety, for PTSD, right? These depression, th- th- these are all states that we are temporarily in, right? We can go into deep states of grief naturally. We're supposed to go through grief in order to endure loss. Why do we become depressed? You look at you look at that. There's factors that determine who gets depressed and who doesn't. There are genetic predispositions, but they're they're not f- our fate. These factors that protect us take us through difficult experiences, which is what we're designed for: is difficulty, right? And that's what protects us. And that's why when we have to be there for each other, we actually become optimally mentally healthy for ourselves. That's his main argument to give yeah. him credit again yeah which yeah. is which was which was a huge influence on me when i said i wanted to create my own model and we we we've talked about community being the core of it is is to really see that science as what's playing out within us and between us and that's the real story of trauma and stress and why we keep getting sicker and sicker um, when when you think about the takeaways that are there that you that you share with folks from the influence of that that work on you. For the people who are listening here, you know, we're talking about society, we're talking about sort of big picture. How do we begin to think of our life through that lens? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're making me think of like our, you know, I think all doctors have their favorite stories to tell of clients that that um and I say it's a favorite cuz they're not as all as dramatically, um, as dramatically successful, but they they this story kind of embodies the model, and whether it's as dramatic as this story or it's a slow pace in other people, it's actually the same story to me of when you see people succeed in recovering from mental illness, where d- that depression becomes the last time they get depressed or they they stop having OCD and they can get off medication. So let's 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 call this client Mary. Um, Mary, um, daughter of a of a man with severe schizophrenia, growing up, her father, who she loved loved so much, her being the most sensitive of the kids, means she has been the most gifted, and at the same time, the one who suffered the most from that stressful environment growing up and suffered the most seeing his pain as he eventually 
either died in very early death or may have even committed suicide because of how severe the schizophrenia was. He was very, very successful, which dramatized for her the pain of his decline and inability to keep, keep his job. So she has struggled with depression all of her life. Um, I met her in her late 40s, very successful um, uh, clothing designer, um, many, many relationships, but could not let anybody get too close and um, suffered with depression. And when I met her, the first thing was helping her see that trauma was actually what underlied this, that the, the first thing that happened was how overwhelming and terrifying and isolate, alienated she, w she became witnessing her father's decline and not having anybody she could turn to for help. Again, in, in a nuclear family, there's mom and dad and a couple kids and there was nobody else. So that meant in her moments of terror and what's happening to dad, there wasn't five, 10 people she could think of that she could run to and get help from, right? Um, and she suffered with chronic panic attacks. And one thing I had at that point felt was so helpful rather than waiting for somebody to come in week after week and say, yeah, you know, it's Friday today. Well, Tuesday I had a panic attack. Let's, and then we talk about the panic attack. I would tell people, text me if you're in that situation. And rather than taking, you know, Ativan or Xanax, and then we talk about it three days later, let's see what we can do differently in that moment if I'm there for you, right? And if you give me at least an hour, I can give you at least five minutes because I at least got five, 10 minutes between each client. And because um, I like to see people get better. That's my thing is people getting better um, rather than we talk about it week after week, month after month. So person who's had 20, 30 years of panic attacks calls me from the um, parking lot of, of a, I don't know, Home Depot. And she's having a panic attack. I won't go into what triggered it, but she called me and I talked her through breathing exercises in that moment, right? Helped her move through that panic attack and, and actually resolve it on her own naturally. So empowered her to regulate her body differently. But she never had a panic attack again. Now, why is that? She never had a panic attack again because that core trauma of reaching out, running to somebody to get help that she couldn't do as a kid, that's what was frozen in her body. That's what was the panic is that when it comes down to fight or flight and I've got to deal with something stressful, I'm all alone. And ha having that new experience, um, she still, though, continued to be depressed. She still continued to carry pain in her heart. How could she, how could she live, how could she trust and live in a society that lets a man decline like that? The pain in her heart, there's a, there's a new term that the VA is using called moral injury to explain why a lot of drone operators who actually have no risk to their lives, they're sitting in Washington dropping a bomb in Afghanistan, but they develop PTSD-like symptoms. And it's being called moral injury that we, we actually can become sick when our sense of the values our society lives by are not in line with what feels right to us, right? I think that's what she suffered from, moral injury. And she couldn't move through her grief and, and reestablish connection with other human beings in terms of intimacy. The big change, and this was like two, three years I worked with her, just really trying to help her open her heart, open her heart, open her heart, nothing. Um, then her sister had a, a child. So when her sister got pregnant and had a child and this new child came into the family, now the conversation was different because now the conversation became, now you are the adult that a child is growing up watching. <clears throat> what is it like for that child to see you and what you believe in how you feel? Now your decision changes. Now it's not just about you, right? 
So we tapped into something purposeful and meaningful. It's not enough for us to change for ourselves. I think that's why self-help books just more and more and more because it doesn't tap into what really motivates us. You know, we, we need to have a purpose. And it, then it mattered. Now it matters for me to make that tough decision. Do I risk opening my heart or not? It's really not enough. I can live with bitterness to the end of my life and pain. But can I hurt somebody else? Can I hurt my niece, right? And, and she, she was off medication at that point within six months. And I, I hear from her time to time just with positive news. But that, that, that story really moves me a lot. Yeah. The idea that, again, purpose seems so simple and yet so big, but can be such a central part of the healing process. Like since the dawn of age, humanity has wondered like, what's our purpose? Like, why do I belong? Why am I here? And even though many of us have a lot of activity in our lives, we have things to do, we have places to show up. Sometimes people just don't even feel like they have a purpose or yeah. they're not sure what that purpose is. I wanna jump to something that you said earlier in the interview that we can expand on here after hearing that story, which is that you shared that a big part of your message for people who come in, and I've heard you say this in, in interviews too, is that there's a reason you're, you're hurting. It's not just, we, we can't just chalk everything up to a chemical imbalance and then throw everything else out the window. Yeah. There's a reason you're in pain. There's a story that you shared on the podcast last time that I thought was really powerful. I'd love you to share it again. It was uh, you being in the rounds and there was a woman that came in that I think that had just found out that her husband was cheating, cheating on, on her. her. Yeah. yeah. Could you share that story? Yeah, it's it goes to the story like the OC, the, the woman with OCD whose parents who got sick when her parents got divorced. It's it's the way where we are, science and healthcare is creating culture and creating beliefs. Like this, this I was an inter, I was in medical school and I was following a primary care doctor, who was a wonderful doctor. And um, you know, part of watching her have this conversation with this woman was seeing how earnest and well-meaning she was. Um, so the woman came in and, and, and started to describe symptoms of that sounded like depression. She was sad, low energy, not eating as much, not deriving joy in anything. Um, and the woman offered up that recently her husband, she found out her husband had been cheating. Why? Because he came home and said, I, I have AIDS. I found out that I have HIV, sorry, HIV. And he had to then report how he got it, right? And the woman, the doctor went straight to, well, a lot of times we, um, you know, these are, you know, depression is not in our control. You know, we have a chemical imbalance and um, it causes us to be prone to depression. And, and there's great medications that can solve that. Um, and, and, and as well-meaning as she was, I just thought that was so wrong. Um, wrong to do that. Wrong because of what it communicates, right? It communicates that your authentic and just protest, right? Our symptoms are often protests. We're talking about outrage. You know, there's an outrage in her. You know, I'm sure she had children. Well, what, what did this man do um, and what risks he brought into their home? And, you know, it, so you, there's one story that looks at the symptom, calls it a disorder and says there's something wrong with you, right? And then says there's something outside of you that can fix it, right? There's another story, and, and by the way, that story has, you know, that says, and you need to be on medication for life. I've had people burst into tears when I say to them, you can recover. They say, I, I, then they run, and they say, I, I still remember the, the, the person in the, in, the, in, the, in the clinic five years ago who said to me, you have generalized anxiety and you're gonna need to cope manage this for life, right? So one story is there's something wrong with you. The other story is that you're, what we're calling a symptom 
is actually your health. That's actually your health. It's her health that is causing, it's her health that is low, sad, not able to eat, not derive joy. It's not time for business as usual. It's time for, wait a second, something really huge happened and I need to reflect. I need to figure out what's going on. I need to turn inward, right? That protest, we're, we're pathologizing, right? We're pathologizing the signals that come from the best parts of us. We grieve for that which we cherish. We mourn for that which is most sacred to us, right? And then if we call grief and mourning depression, not only are we pathologizing what it is to be human, right? Um, but we're also suppressing a signal that alerts us as a community to what needs to be addressed, right? What's going on that this man is out there getting sick and why is he unhappy that he and he's going somewhere else? What, What's happening? If you live in a group of people and you're in it together, well, then you, you don't just cut somebody out either. You, you, we, we, we try and figure out what's going on. And these signals are what bring us together to solve problems, right? I wonder, you know, for, for so many folks who are listening and hearing about your work, in this instance with this woman, hers was an, an event, but that event was a traumatic event. And if we don't deal with that trauma, it's very difficult to move on. And when I say deal with it, that's just the terms that I'm using right now. It's actually leaning into it, feeling it, going through it, our body getting sick because it's actually crying out for help from other people to support. And sure, sometimes medication can be a part of that process that's there, you know better than anybody else, but there's also more that's needed. Yeah. For, for most folks, would you say that are in the mental health, like in the category where they're struggling with some version of mental health, do you feel that the vast majority of it is childhood traumas that have not been properly looked at and addressed for the impact that they had on that person? Like when you look at society today, do you feel that most of what people are going through is some version of childhood trauma? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one precedes the next like we're we're living in a progressively more dysregulated way right if 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 50 years ago in if in the 50s we we reduced the number of eyes that a child experiences looking out for them if in the 80s it became okay for the two people running the village to walk away um if in the 90s and early 2000s, then that one parent or two parents might be looking at their phone half the time that you're around as a child growing up. We're, 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 we are, we're challenging our nervous systems to self-regulate in more and more diminished experiences. So trauma doesn't have to be somebody physically abused me, although that's a lot of it. It's also just, high levels of adversity um, in childhood set in early childhood let's let's start there if it's in the first two to three years that's when the brain especially the brain stem which is where the fight or flight stress response system so we talk about inflammation on probably you know a lot of your podcasts you know we talk about the stress response and that's what ignites inflammation well that all comes from the brain stem not in the higher thinking part of our brain. Fight or flight is in the brainstem, and that's still developing up until the age of three. In those first three years, um, if the environment is not regulated, if the environment is not moderately, predictably, rhythmically um, stressful, we need stress to grow, but we need stress in the kinds of predictable rhythms, right? I can track my mom's coming and going. I can track my dad's coming and going. Um, that alters the brainstem. It sensitizes it, right? So it sensitizes it where 
dysregulation, chaos is actually what I need to pay attention to. I need to be able to thrive, which means I should stay on edge. It's kind of like, you can say the brainstem is like um, the, 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 the government organizations that are managing um, the pandemic, right? If numbers of cases of COVID are going up, we go from yellow, you know, we go from green to orange to yellow to red, right? So we respond to regulate the threat. A healthy brainstem is doing the same. It's sensing the internal environment and the external environment. And ideally, when there's a threat, it mounts a response. Well, if it's chaotic, then it's better to be on edge. It makes sense to actually never relax. If day-to-day -day life is chaotic, it's better to not actually relax because that's not survival. That's not the best for our survival. So then the brainstem becomes naturally just sensitized. Now that person needs threat then to feel safe because it's not in response to a situation anymore. It's just how my body rolls. It's how my body functions. We're used to the chaos. We need the chaos regularly in our life to yeah. feel normal. Right. And so that I think is why we're on this spiral of going faster and faster. That's why I think the biggest addiction is actually workaholism. That's why we are happy to have technology that lets us, you know, respond to emails in bed at 10 30 11 o'clock at night we we need dopamine we become a we need that dopamine hit partly because that's how we feel at peace right many people just can't sit still anymore so i think that there's a low grade level of advert i, I think that there's a lot more people suffering even um and have societal sanctioned ways of regulating a dysregulated nervous system and, uh, but to go back to your core question, you know, is, is childhood trauma? Because I think there's a lot of important points to make there. Like, yes, it is. And the subsequent years, more trauma happens to the person who hasn't healed the original trauma. So the effect of, of trauma is to be in a chronic state of either overactivation, which is what we've been talking about, but also underactivation. So we have fight or flight, but we also have a third mechanism. It's called freeze, also called immobile. When you hear the, the words like, you know, I went through something and they say, shake it off. The freeze response is literally we, we play dead or we withdraw inward. If we're not in a situation that we can run or fight, the best solution is to actually withdraw inward and either prepare to be injured or we, so if our bloodstream, if our, if, our, if, our, if our systems turn inward, if we dissociate from our bodies, we can withstand more pain. We release high levels of endorphins in those situations. We can stay stuck in that state. A child growing up in an environment that's chaotic or threatening can't run and can't fight because they depend on that caregiver. So that dissociative, immobile, free state is something that we can stay stuck in, right? And that makes us numb, more compliant, more submissive, um, disconnected from our um, ability to mount a fight or flight response. So that person is the one who then goes into school and is more easily targeted. That's the person who in high school may not make, um, you know, get into sports, get into things that you know, would, 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 would help their mental health and physical health thrive. That's the person who in, in an organization, in a corporation, in an institution, um, you know, takes, takes on the, you know, uh, absorbs bullying or mistreatment. Um, so trauma, unresolved trauma leads to more trauma. Just like if you walk on a broken bone, if you walk on a broken ankle, the fracture gets worse. Um, so, oh, yeah. While we have you here for a little bit longer, uh, any we start off the conversation where we were talking about how society is sort of sick in a way, right? Like why yeah. is society so sick? And we started off with the conversation of loneliness and then we really then migrated into this conversation of, which is one of the parts that drives loneliness of 
the breakdown in breakdown in community. Yeah. Where's loneliness coming from? It's coming from the breakdown in community that's there. And then also the impact of trauma, specifically childhood trauma. Yeah. There's the work that you're doing, but when you look across the globe, because human, humanity is always evolving, are there interesting models or ways of living that you see that people are trying where <clears throat> there could be some promise for how we go forward from here? Yeah, that's a, so, that's a great question. Um, the What you went through there was like, okay, trauma, community breakdown. One of the things that motiv one of the things that really motivates me <clears throat> is to look for the root cause rather than treating the symptom in the clinic. Um, that's in our clinic. In 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 the nonprofit, we're we're talking about the same thing. Is like, what's the real root cause, right? The real root cause that's leading to all of that, and in in, in 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 from my perspective, is culture. It's 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 a disintegrative culture that's creating practices of disconnection, disconnection from our bodies, from each other, from meaningful values. So what do I mean by disintegrative culture? And then I'll answer your question about what are some, some models we can go by? I think the models are ancient ones. Um, <clears throat> the conversation we had on the phone before the, the podcast was about, you know, how our country so divided. You know, you, you come, your, your family's from another country, from another culture, and, and so is mine. And we, we, I came, my family came to this culture for all of the positive benefits that we know America brings, the freedom, the, 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 the freedom for individual expression, the, the safety, um, democracy. <clears throat> um, but we come from cultures that have nurtured wisdom. Um, there's historians and philosophers talk about America being an, at an adolescent phase and its development, which I think is really true. We're, we're very young. We're only a few hundred years old. And as a culture, I think we're at an adolescent phase. <clears throat> you know, an adolescent um, gets really rigid ideas, right? Takes on a cause, shouts people down because they need to stand up for something in order to prove themselves to the community. <clears throat> an elder, an adult and an elder has gained the wisdom of complexity. The elder is the one who's been around long enough to know that there's no one right answer, that there's always, that the truth is a verb, that we, there's many different perspectives and each situation has to be seen. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're on the wrong track, I think, because our culture has oriented around individuality. So individuality is a value that I think America and the West um, and individual liberty has championed and 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 we're all we're all thankful and we benefit from that but it also reduced the whole story of what human nature is to individualism that the end and the purpose of life is you is your personal pursuits right so that's that drives our behavior. Stories are what drive our behavior. And if 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 we're told that my individual personal fulfillment is the end, well then that's what I pursue. And if you look at how we function, that is most you know that I think that is at the root of it is that we're we're and that's where we're starving, we're called like hungry ghosts. We are we are disconnected from our full nature, which is both individualistic and oriented towards group and connected to nature and connected to our environment, connected to meaningful ideas. This whole person approach is rooted in a philosophy that we are, our, our health is interdependent. It's not just one side of us. Who gets this, you know, for me, this, the ground level story of like how I came to work the way I do is growing up in a family that had 20, 30 people getting together on a weekly basis. And that meant when I was lost and struggling as a teenager, there were many people who were looking out for me and there were many people that it mattered to me to conduct myself well, right? Like that woman, Mary, that it mattered for me to be more brave, find more compassion, be more patient, develop virtues and skills, right? And then coming to mental health and seeing 
individuals growing up in alienated, isolated families, lacking that nurturing support, and then being told there's something wrong with them, right? When their symptoms actually make total sense. And that the real story is the loss of conditions that bring out our health. So what we, what, what I'm writing about and what we talk about in the nonprofit, when you look at um, cultures throughout history and many different civilizations, they've created wisdom traditions. So your family is from India. Yoga comes from India and it's, and it's a wisdom tradition. And what is the word yoga mean? It means yoke, to bring back together the mind, the body. We are, 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 are um, you know, in, in China, it's Tai Chi. In the Native Americans created sweat lodge and vision quest that we have practices. When you look at all these practices, they're all kind of designed to do the same thing, which is to bring our mind and our body back together in connection before and with the community, right? The sweat lodge intensely subjects you to heat so that you can't hold on to your own individuality but you're here before the community. You have to uncover your deeper capacities. So these are ancient technologies. There's a, you know, trauma. We're talking about trauma. There's substantial research that yoga reverses the effects of trauma. Doing yoga 15, 20 minutes a day is better for depression than an antidepressant. Why? And first of all, that really then challenges that these are chemical imbalances and that it's our fate if you can reverse it with the mind-body practice. So mind-body practices, these are all mind-body practices. These are all methods that different cultures have created to help us reintegrate into what it is to be a whole person. Um, so we need community, we need, we need these things. And I think, that, um, I think that's why we're at our worst. I think like adolescents bickering <laughs> over who's right, but at the same time, you see in health and wellness, like the emergence of yoga and mindfulness and all of these old ancient technologies, right, that are coming back. You see there's this resurgence of interest in Native American traditions. And, you know, you see psychedelics and plant medicines. These are all ancient approaches. Psychedelics are part of an old tradition of transformational experiences in which you get out of your head, get back into direct experience in your body, transform in the presence of community. That's one of my big things in the psychedelic community is we need practices for transformation to be in community, This the, the for them to really transform society. Um, yeah. Well, Omen, I feel like we could have two more hours to continue yeah. the conversation. There's so much to get into when you start opening it up. And just like most things in life, there's not a, there's not a, there's straight, there's clear takeaways, but it's not a simple takeaway. We're talking about layers and layers of items that are all interdependent yeah. that need to be peeled off and looked at, both in people's lives and in society. But I think we hit some of the big themes that are there. Um, I would love to do this again and kind of piggyback into part two of this conversation. Um, you've mentioned the nonprofit a few times. Just just give a shout out to the work that you guys are doing there yeah. and where people can find you in your clinic. Yeah. The nonprofit is Lameda Project, L-A-M-A-I-D-A um, dot org is where you can find it, uh, Lameda Project. We are implementing the model, um, this model in a major foster care mental health agency, teaching how food and yoga, meditation, those things can transform foster kids' lives. We're implementing um, what we call a blueprint in schools to make the school see themselves as an optimal ecosystem. Um, the clinic is Hope Integrative Psychiatry. You can find it at um, hopepsychiatry.com. We're based right now in Los Angeles. We have a team um, that works in the model that I've been talking about today. Um, we really believe in people's innate capacity to heal, to um, transform their lives. If you put all the pieces together, complete recovery is possible um, and uh, and restoring meaning and purpose in our lives. Yeah. Beautiful. We'll link to all those in the show notes. Omid, 
Thank you so much for coming on the podcast again and sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Great conversation.